Good morning. So I just got a chance to talk to Charlie. I'm He's not been been to the restaurant yet, but we're going to get there I'm soon. It's unique. So a little bit about Charlie. He is one of those rare native Houstonians. He has been described by a friend as a hopeless serial entrepreneur. His first business was a picture frame shop that he opened with $244 cash, a $500 bank loan, a pregnant wife, and a three-year-old son. Now, I have to tell you, Charlie, when I read that, I was thinking, what in the world? What was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Just thinking, my husband would come to me, you know, in that state. I don't know that I'd be too excited. Over the next 33 years, he opened 43 stores, started two chains of picture and frame stores, and in 1983 was named one of one of 10 outstanding contributors to the picture frame industry. In 1984, he found Goodson's Cafe for sale. So him and his son, Jimmy, were partners for Goodson's Cafe for over 18 years. After working on his new concept for his steakhouse for over two years, Charlie sold his half to his son, Jimmy, in 2003. In 2005, he opened the Steamboat House on Sam Houston Parkway next to Sam Houston Race Park. Steamboat House is an award-winning Texas State House and the, and the Texas History Museum. The museum is called a tribute to Sam Houston and the heroes of the Republic of Texas. For his work in preserving and promoting Texas history, Charlie was made an honorable member of the Sons of the Republic in Texas in 2009. And on April 5th, 2014, he was given the highest award when he was made Knight of the Order of St. Jacinto. That organization has over 4,500 members and only 36 living knights. Please join me in welcoming Charlie Fogarty. Thank you. You're welcome. You know, I think I was uh, born as an entrepreneur. By the time I was in high school, my, uh, I was the first person at Lamar High School to ever take advanced wood shop. <clears throat> I, uh, I built five boats before I got out of high school. When I signed up for advanced wood shop, my brother, who was going to Rice Institute at the time, and the only way you got in was your brain and your good grades, he gave me the lecture of a lifetime from an older brother told me I needed more math than science, and I told him if I needed that, I would hire somebody that had it. <laughs> you know, over the years, it's amazing how many times Tomball, Texas, and I have crossed paths. Uh, even though I was born in Houston, raised in Houston, and I don't think there's anyone here that goes back in the school system old enough, long enough <clears throat> to remember a lady who uh, moved here from Belleville, Texas, and was a teacher. Her second job was teaching in Tomball School District. I had never heard of Tomball at that time, but her name was Doja, at that time, Doja, no, she was Doja Foster. You knew her at Doja Martins. She married, she moved here, and she married a fellow by the name of Martins. She taught in the Tomball School District for many years, but before she came here, she was, a, her first job teaching was in Belleville, Texas, and that's where my grandparents lived, where my mother was born and grew up. And uh, Doja, when she became a, hired as a teacher in Belleville, had to look around and find a place to stay. And she rented a room from my grandparents, and she and one of my aunts were great friends. They used to love to go out and fish together. And I knew Doja, Doja when I was this tall. When, when back in the back in the early 1940s, when she was she was in Belleville, when uh, when I got out of high school, my very first job, and I uh, had the, the gal that I married, <coughs> unfortunately the first time, the gal that I married, we had a we did real well for a reasonable number of years, but uh, when I got out of high school, my very first job was driving the Harris County Public Library bookmobile. We got married while I was driving, while I was the driver of the bookmobile, and she was working for ER Squibb downtown Houston in the old M&M building. And uh, in my very first job of driving that bookmobile, one of our stops was on Main Street in Tomball, toward the east side of downtown 
probably about a quarter of a block before the railroad tracks and we parked under a big oak tree and came here probably once a month to Tomball, Texas. Uh, when we left, we went to Dory Brothers store, which was over on Spring Cypress at either Student or Airline or Kirkendall. I, I did that for a year and a half or so in my second job. I was also studying going to night school at the University of Houston studying home building and light construction. Uh, even the aptitude test that I took at the University of Houston said this guy will never make it by, with a desk job. He likes building things and all that sort of thing. So my course was that I was studying was through the School of Business and the School of Architecture and it was called Home Building and Light Construction. And I took the, I went to University of Houston at night and worked in the daytime. And uh, pretty soon I got to the point where I had to have a little surgery on my lower back and I decided it's time to quit bouncing around in that bookmobile. And I went to an employment agency that someone recommended, said this guy is the greatest, he can find you a job that'll somehow or another coordinate with what you're doing. And I got a job working with a contractor supply and lumber company out in Harrisburg. I was a sales trainee. And what a sales trainee does is that sales trainee until he learns what everything is in that lumber yard. He loads trucks and unloads trucks and empties box cars and works, helps to pull all the supplies, pull the orders out of the various warehouses. And uh, you want to learn in a hurry, especially when you start if it's summertime and 90 something degrees. About three months later, I got moved inside. I did lumber sales. Uh, sometime at night, if I didn't have a school, to, a class to go to that night, we and several of the other sales trainees would do takeoffs on plans figuring out how many how many two by fours and how many what size and how many two by sixes and two by eights and all the things we needed for that builder. Still remember, and I don't even have this on my notes, but when I said that, I remember one of the early set of plans that we did a takeoff on was for Payne and Kickerella. Uh, a fellow named Tommy Payne and Vincent Kickerella, and of course Vince Kickerella ended up being one of the big important builders in all of Houston. And uh, one day Mr. Kickerella got a call from the banker and said, you guys need some money in that account. And he said, we just put some money in that account. And he said, yes, but Mr. Payne uh, withdrew it yesterday. Mr. Payne had gone to Mexico to enjoy life and Mr. Kickerella decided he never wanted another partner again as long as he lived. Well, by the time I left that lumber yard, <clears throat> I did something. I was hoping we had some teenage type people here. To, to give them a little lecture in what you do if you want to go get move up in life. You always do the best job you can. I don't care what you get paid for. You do the best job you can and you will stand out in the crowd. By the time I left there, I was had become the uh, buyer for the paint department. This was Contractor Supply, which is one of the three largest lumber companies in town. It's, it's gone now. But uh, I was the buyer in the paint department and once a year I had to put together what they call a fall dating order. And I ordered someplace, this is back in the, in the 50s, I ordered between forty and sixty thousand dollars worth of paint and had to kind of calculate out what would be, we would be using during the winter time. It, you ordered it, it came in in the fall and the paint companies sometime in the late fall, the paint companies wanted those folks in the south to be buying paint it didn't have to be paid for till sometime in the spring. Uh, up north, they don't do a lot of painting when the snow is falling. <clears throat> anyway, I was a buyer in the paint department, didn't run the paint department, but the old man that ran it, he and I were friends for many years. And uh, I also ended up running the hardware department. I can go master key locks. If you get, put me in a place where the equipment is there, I can make, I can make two keys that'll fit the same lock. Uh, two different keys that'll fit the same lock. I think I can make three of them that would do that. But uh, when I, one of the fellows that was an outside salesman for Contractor Supply, he left Contractor Supply and went to work for Stallman Lumber Company. They're still on the Southwest Freeway at Greenbrier. His name was Roger Schultz. We have a Roger Schultz here, but it's not the same Roger Schultz. And uh, Roger called me one afternoon, and he, I lived in Bel Air. I lived in a little house I played, paid $8,200 for. I sure wish I had the lot today. I sold it in a down economy, sold it for, for 
$7,900. If you own the lot today, it would be worth someplace between three and four hundred thousand dollars, or maybe the price has gone up since then. But uh, Roger called me, wanted me to come by, wanted to talk to me at Stallman Lumber Company. And actually when I got there, Roger introduced me to a fellow named Andy Cole that was the yard manager. <clears throat> Stallman's had three different yards at that time, one on the Katy Freeway, one down in Missouri City, and one on the original one on Greenbrier. And Andy hired me to, uh, to be kind of his assistant in that lumber yard. And when I went to work there, shortly thereafter, I was overseeing two fellows. One was in his 50s and one was in his 60s. And uh, I got to be good friends with the outside sales fellows. In fact, one of them passed away about six or eight months ago, and he and I were friends for 50-something years. His name was Virgil Fry. But uh, I, I there again tried to do the best job I could and be honest with everything I did. And I was there for a couple of years, two, two and a half years, and Roger left there. And he went to work for South Texas Lumber, which was a division of Temple Industries out of East Texas. Temple Industries was eventually sold out to Louisiana Pacific, a larger lumber company that, that purchased them. But at that time, when Roger worked there, uh, they had some lumber yards literally all over Texas. I was familiar with the one in Belleville because that's where my grandparents lived and I, they called it South Texas Lumber. And so I had seen that South Texas Lumber Yard in Belleville for years and they had little lumber yards or decent sized little lumber yards they had opened all over the state of Texas. And Roger called me when I was at Stallings and said drop by after work I want to talk to you. And he said uh, Charlie we'd like to hire you and we'd like to train you to run a lumber yard for us. By then I'm married and have, uh, have a kid We'd like to have you run a lumber yard for us. We don't know where it is yet, but when you're ready and we're ready to move you, we will pay all of your moving expenses and, and get you moved to wherever that lumber yard is. And I said, Roger, let me think about that a few days. And I thought about it. And I thought when I called Roger back, I said, Roger, I hate to say this and do this because you've been so good to me and you've given me a couple of great breaks or given me one great break and I said, but I don't like the lumber business. I can't stand it. And I think when you go to do something for a vocation, you need to do something you enjoy. And I turned him down, and I spent about a week kicking myself in the rear end saying, I wonder how long if that'll ever happen again, I'll ever get that kind of good break. And uh, probably less than two weeks later, I got a call from a guy named Charlie Hamilton. Charlie was the outside sales rep that I dealt with with Pratt & Lambert Paint when I was the buyer at, at uh, Contractor Supply. Charlie covered Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Arkansas and sold Pratt & Lambert Paint and worked with the architects trying to get them to specify Pratt & Lambert Paint. And uh, Charlie said, I just bought the Spiller Company over in the University Village on Rice Boulevard. Uh, would you come over Sunday afternoon? I'd like to talk to you about running that paint store for me. And I went over and met Charlie that afternoon, and when he, when he walked in the paint store, he said, by the way, said, there's some picture frame samples hanging on the wall. There's some equipment in the back, and there's some molding, picture frame molding and supplies back there. If you can figure out how to make picture frames, we'll stay in that business. And if you can't, I'll put all that stuff in a garage sale and get rid of it. I went to work for Charlie, uh, Hamilton, uh, February the 1st, 1962. And it didn't take me long to realize, he, of course, he's going to be out traveling, and my helper in the store is going to be his wife. And it didn't take me long to realize I wasn't going to get along with the Hamiltons real well. We, we sold paint and wallpaper and had some people would come in, want to look at all the colors. And Mrs. Hamilton wanted to save money, so she had turned the lights down where you had hardly any light on. And when you came in from a bright sunny day, there were people, they couldn't tell what kind of store they were in, much less see any colors or anything else, or if they were bringing in something to be framed. We were also two doors down from Wellhausen's Picture Framing, which was a very popular, probably one of the oldest, uh, old-time picture frame shops in Houston. A couple of doors down, well, at night when I'd leave or when I had a spare minute, I'd go down and look in their front window and see what they were doing. Then I'd go back and figure out how to do it. And uh, I went to work again February the 1st. 
And sometime in September, or probably September the 1st, I turned in my resignation. And I decided with, this, with a pregnant wife and a three-year-old kid and $244 cash and a $500 bank loan, I'm going into picture frame business. The Lord looked out for me a whole bunch of times and he was looking out for me then because I had a terrible location off of Stella Link Road. I was, a, I was near the big shopping center that had an Alfred's Delicatessen and some other things in it. And the man that owned that was Albert Farr, the great, uh, the fellow whose uh, son became the great uh, apartment developer in Houston, Harold Farr. And Albert, Harold was about six foot two and had a lot of hair and Albert was about five foot seven and was bald, but he was a real nice guy and owned, he owned uh, shopping centers literally all over Houston. And Albert came in there one afternoon and uh, didn't have anything else to do. And he, he decided he was going to, I had a one-year lease and a five-year option. He decided he's going to be nice to me and cut my rent. He could see I was starving to death. <clears throat> I want to tell you there were some days when business was so slow that I really questioned what in the world am I doing here. There were times I'd go in the back room and cry. Uh, there were times I'd go back and pray. I even called several people in the drywall business to see if anybody was hiring drywall salesmen to call on lumber yards. My dear mother, who was the greatest thing that ever happened to me, uh, my mother was one of the finest Christians that I ever have ever known in my life. She was one of the most Christ-like people that ever existed. She was always doing something for someone else without any concern of whether they're going to reciprocate or not, but she was a fabulous Christian lady. And uh, she, even when she was old, she would, at the little Lutheran church that we went to in Bel Air, oh, I ended up with the name Fogarty. I'm in a German community that I love called Tombaugh. My mother's half was, was, was German. Her maiden name was Machamel, or the old German way to say it was Mahamel. Her mother was a Strauss. The Mahamels got here in 1849 to Texas. The Strausses got here a lot later in 1852. Uh, the Strausses were some of the founders of that famous big city between, Cats, between uh, Sealy and Belleville called Cat Spring. It's only one cat and one spring. But you drive up and down those roads, you'll see Strauss' name on a bunch of the mailboxes still today. In fact, we had the Strauss family reunion at Milheim right down the road from Cat Spring. If you can't find Cat Spring, I know you can't find Milheim. But, uh, so I, I feel very at home in a German community and, and really love it. And uh, anyway, my wife and I finally had two more kids. We had a total of four kids. We lived out in Greenwood Forest. My oldest son, when it came time for his 16th birthday, he had read a story written in the Houston Chronicle all about a little lady who had a cafe out in Huffsmith called Goodson's Cafe. And Tommy said, Dad, that's where I want to go for my 16th birthday. And uh, we went to Goodson's and figured out how to get there. We didn't have all this GPS thing. I, I don't remember how I managed to find out where it was because that was really the one of the, it wasn't the second time because I'd been to, under the old oak tree several times, but anyway, we found Goodson's Cafe, and I thought it was, it was lightly raining that night. I'd taken an umbrella with me, and cars were parked up and down Huff Smith Road, and there was a space someplace close to the front that I managed to pull into, and I thought, well, this is good. And then I realized there were two, two or three groups of people standing under umbrellas waiting to get in, standing in line for their turn to go inside. I stood under an umbrella for 45 minutes, the kids were in the, in the vehicle, stood under there for 45 minutes waiting for our turn to get to go inside. And I was so excited when they finally, when we were first in line and they opened the door and I thought, well, we're going to get to go eat. No, that was wrong. We got to be the group that stood inside waiting for the next available table. So another 10, 15, 20 minutes we had to wait till we could get in. And we had, we had our chicken fried steak and everything that went along with it. And uh, anyway, in, in my, that first business, I had my mother, which I forgot to say, my mother kept saying, Charlie, there's an empty space. This is toward the 10 or 11 months into this 12 month 
lease. There's an empty space up in the shopping center, of course, close to her home on Bel Air Boulevard. And why don't you call and it's got a for lease sign. And I called and got a hold of the landlord's son-in-law and he wasn't real interested in anything. And I waited another, he never did anything about it, I waited another month or so. My mother said that space is still uh, available on Bel Air Boulevard. And so I called again. This time I got a hold of uh, the landlord's son, who later on became a very big uh, real estate developer and apartment developer. And he was in my office or in my shop within 10 minutes. I was down Bel Air Boulevard off of Stella Lake, and this shopping center was on Bel Air Boulevard at Stella Lake. And uh, Harvey Hout Jr. made me a deal. I couldn't use the whole space. He said, I'm going to give you the front end of that space and a little hallway back to the restroom. You can keep your molding in that hallway. And said, one of my other tenants is in the appliance business and wants to have a plant, an appliance repair place somewhere he can get to it. And I'll give him the back end. And I was there for a total of almost six years. Uh, by the time I got, by the time I was getting out here to, to Tomball with Goodson's, we had already uh, moved. Uh, I started a new business and I came up with a new idea uh, when I moved to Bel Air Boulevard. I, I gave up my, uh, my little business on Bel Air Boulevard. I was there for six years and it is instantly, as soon as I moved to Bel Air Boulevard, I went from losing $96 and not making a nickel that year to making an income. Uh, the way we ate is I worked for European Import at night when I closed my shop up, that first shop. European Import was Spec's biggest competitor. Spec's had about three stores and European Import had two of them. But uh, anyway, when, uh, when, when I, we had that wonderful time at Goodson's Cafe and I had the opportunity after opening, after, while I was on Bel Air Boulevard, in the center that I.W. Marks is in today. He was not there then. He came along several years after I left <clears throat> and purchased the little jewelry store that probably did not cover more than about 800 total square feet. But uh, anyway, we, got, we did so well that uh, my wife decided uh, she wanted to move to a different area. We moved to 1960. That's where we were when, we found, when I found Goodson's for sale and moved out to 1960 and the, that marriage family went down the tubes. I, I suggest to anyone who's going to get married to go spend six months counseling before you get married so you make sure you're both on the same page. Go to a good marriage counselor and make sure you're both on the same page with what you want to do with your life and where you're going with it. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, we, we ended up divorcing and uh, I lived, ended up living in a townhouse that I had off Memorial Drive just inside of Eldridge. And I had my daughters almost every other, almost every weekend because Nancy got busy in the real estate business and uh, my ex-wife and got busy in the real estate business. And after a couple of years, I decided, you know, when my daughters get a little bit older, they're almost teenagers, they're, I'm not going to see them again on the weekends. So I decided I wanted to move to the Tomball area because she had moved there when, when she sold, we sold the house out in, in Greenwood Forest. She had moved to Tomball. And I decided I wanted to move to Tomball to be closer to my daughters as they're growing up. And I also by then had a couple of horses out in the Belleville area with a piece of property my brother and I owned. And uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to be able to keep a horse or two in the backyard and uh, get to be closer to the daughters. And uh, my, my ex-wife called me one day and she knew I wanted to move out here and she said, I'm going to be, we were, we were friends. She said, I'm going to be showing a home out in one of, she didn't say that, but Jack Fry subdivision called Holly Creek. And she said, I'm going to be showing a real nice home out there. This couple has gotten financial trouble and I'm going to be showing a home at 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm not going to introduce you. Here's what the address is. You be there, and when you see me get out of the vehicle and these other people get out, you just follow us in. And the reason this is, this is a great deal, all these people need is for somebody to, to uh, take over their loan. You won't, you'll have to pay some of my expenses, but you won't have to pay anything, you know, all the rest thing. You need to get your, find, if you like it, you need to talk to your banker and see if he'll 
loan you whatever that balance is, they owe it on the house. And I got through and walked through this house and uh, didn't say anything to anyone, just watched around. It was on, uh, on about almost, almost five, a little less than five acres and had a barn in the back and a fenced off place for your horses and uh, had a pool in the backyard. It was a really nice house. I never said anything to anybody and uh, Nancy had told me what, what I need, how much money it was going to cost, what the loan balance was. I called my banker on Monday morning he said, hey Charlie, I'll finance it for you uh, if you want to buy the house. And we ended up, and I'd take in the meantime, I took my then wife by and we drove around the neighborhood and looked at it. And uh, we ended up buying the house and moving to a Tomball address. So now I'm back in Tomball again. And uh, anyway, we, we've had, while I was in Tomball, uh, my son, my youngest son, who was the pregnancy that my wife had when, uh, when I went into business the first time, his name is Jimmy, down here at Goodson's Cafe now. But at that time, I ended up, I went to the mall shopping centers and started opening stores in the malls. And I had a total then of, I'd, I'd opened a total of 25 mall stores from 1976 to 1979. In 1979, I sold my out of town mall stores. I sold 12 stores to a fellow that one time was on the school board. His name was Harold Otto, and he was the chairman of the board of Wicks and Sticks, and they were looking for something else to franchise. And I sold him my out of town stores. They changed the name of those stores to Deck the Walls. And they sold about 300 or 350 deck the wall franchises all across America. Over a period of time, I eventually sold them some of the deck, some of the frame it stores I had. My my you frame it stores were the do it yourself, and I sold most of those to the managers, my managers, as I started opening the mall stores. And I called the mall stores frame it instead of you frame it. But uh, I I still had 13 stores left in mall shopping centers in the greater Houston area. My son had gone, Jimmy had gone to uh, Stephen F. Austin in Nacogdoches. Had they ever given him a diploma, he would have had a summa cum laude in partying. <laughs> I told him after the first year, dad's not paying for year three unless year two gets a lot better. At the end of year, toward the end of year two, he called me to tell me he wasn't going to be going back to school. He was going to learn the restaurant business. And he said, I've been interviewed by one manager and have to be interviewed by another one. And he said, and I said, what kind of job is that where you have to be interviewed by two managers? He said, there's a bartender. And I said, hey, you're going to fit right in. <laughs> and 13 months later, he really wanted to learn the restaurant business. 13 months later, he had been a bartender, head bartender. The, man the managers at his restaurant knew that he wanted to advance and every time he had that covered they let him do other things in the restaurant that he would have to do in a training program to be able to advance on. The name of those restaurants was Spoons. They had five of them in Houston and they were going to train people here and ship them to Chicago and, uh, and to Oregon to open Spoons restaurants and other places. A big corporation had purchased them. And Thirteen months later he had been Again, the bartender, the head bartender, a manager trainee, he was made a floating manager. He had a set of keys to all five spoons and he would go run one of those, each one of those spoons as one of the managers was taking his day off. And uh, 13 months later, they had, he had been not only a floating manager, but they moved him back to Willowbrook Mall as one of the two managers there. I took a picture frame molding salesman who I used to buy a lot of supplies from and other, other items to do with the frame industry. Uh, he loved chicken fried steak. So I decided in August of 1984, I took my friend Eric Carlson to dinner at Goodson's Cafe. And I hate to say it, but the roaches were crawling on the walls. Uh, it was in terrible shape. Ellie Goodson was 78 years old and not in good health. And uh, but when Eric and I pulled up out front, there was a for sale sign in the front flower bed. And the next morning I called Jimmy. I knew he wasn't going to work until that afternoon. And I said, Jimmy, what's the most famous restaurant in Tomball? And to show you he's a lot smarter than I am, they had just opened the McDonald's up here on Main Street. And he said, Dad, everybody knows that'd be McDonald's. I said, what's the most famous hometown restaurant? And he said, oh, that's Maul Goodson's. And I said, meet me there for lunch 
at about 11 o'clock, let's eat and talk about it, said, uh, uh, it's for sale. And I had already purchased a little building in Tomball from a guy named Ted Payton. I think it was Ted Payton, yeah, Ted Payton. And when I bought that building, I had a little idea in the back of my head. One of my ex-managers, who at one time was also the vice president of uh, my frame operation, she said she and her husband Jim had gone to a place in, out in, somewhere, in, somewhere in Colorado and went to a do-it-yourself steakhouse. And, uh, and she said, she told me about what they did and they, uh, they cooked steaks across from whoever they were going to sit with at the big long picnic table, told me all about it. Uh, and I thought, you know, one day I might open a do-it-yourself steakhouse. I always kind of wanted to be in the restaurant business. And I was telling my daughters about it one Saturday morning as we were picking up some things at Burger King or McDonald's, one of the two, and going to head off to where we were going that day. And I was telling them about it, and they said, Dad, where would you put that? And I'm going down Main Street in Tomball, just turn left, or just turn left off of Main Street onto to, uh, 149 back in those days. And I said, I'd put it right there. And uh, this is after driving down the road a short distance. Later on, when I came back that afternoon, we would come back home, I noticed there's a for sale sign where I pointed to. And I talked to Ted uh, a day or so later, and I said, what, what kind of price are you asking for this? He had a real estate office down upstairs, and his wife had an antique shop downstairs. He said, what do you want to put here? And I said, I eventually want to put a restaurant here. And he said, that's the only thing you can't put here. I said, why can't I put a restaurant here? And he said, because uh, this is not in the city. You're going to need the city water, sewer, and gas to operate a restaurant. Well, I called the city manager, I forget his name now, but I met him and we were friends and asked him when, it, when was Tom Ball going to be expanding more and taking more property in. He said, we don't have the power to because we're in Houston's extraterritorial jurisdiction. And uh, he said, but if your property is adjoining Tom Ball property and you petition the city, and I'll show you how to do that. You petition the city, we'll take you in because we want your tax money. And he said, by the way, your properties are joining the city on three sides. All you have to do is petition and you can get in. And uh, anyway, I petitioned the city. I'd run it for about a year and a half before I found Goodson's for sale. I'd run it for about a year and a half as a picture frame outlet store just to have something to do with it. And uh, Jimmy and I started, as soon as we got through talking and everything, made a deal, a handshake deal with Ella Goodson in the back of her restaurant. Ella was a real sweet lady, had very little business sense, and her sister, Martha Luce, kept explaining how all this was going to work. And uh, anyway, we bought Goodson's, we remodeled the building, and made it into a little restaurant, the little two-story building that used to be out front. This, where it was is the parking, front parking lot of Goodson's. And Jimmy and I were partners for 18 and a half years. I still had frame shops for the first 12, and I slowly was getting rid of them, and I'd go work in the restaurant some. And then I spent the last six or seven years working with the, in the restaurant. When I was on Bel Air Boulevard, I acquired, a fellow gave me two paintings that were in a building that was getting ready to be bulldozed. And these two paintings were magnificent old portraits of Sam Houston and George Washington. Uh, in 1976, I framed them up and put them on an A-frame easel and uh, called, I wanted them someplace for Bicentennial. And I thought the grandest place for them would be in the lobby of the Texas Commerce Bank. And I called the lady in charge of that, that uh, advertising PR and she said, I'm sorry, we've never displayed anything in the Texas Commerce Bank lobby and I don't think we'll start now. But I'll come look at them and see if there's any other place we can use them. For one time in my life, I bit my tongue. And she came out and looked at him, and as soon as she saw him sitting on this A-frame easel that was all stained and had paneling on the ends with a nice frame piece to tell who painted them and what they were painted for. They were used in the 1936 San Jacinto Centennial, the 100th anniversary of the Battle of San Jacinto and Texas Independence from Mexico. So Sam, they're both really historic paintings, especially the one of Sam, because I think it's the greatest portrait ever painted of him. And the lady came out, and when she saw him, she got a grin on her face, and she said, I tell you what, that'd be the first thing ever displayed in the Texas Commerce Bank lobby. When I get back, this was on a Friday, when I get back Monday to the office, I'll call you and tell you which Sunday afternoon that you can come down and y'all set it up, and I'll have the, uh, uh, the guards at the bank open the, open the place up for you. 
and then I'll tell you what, you know, when you come pick them up, you know, a few weeks later. Well, when, when Tomball, Tomball was a real lucky city because the Chamber of Commerce, I guess, did some work with the Centennial Commission, and we had a sesquicentennial office here in Tomball. And uh, a fellow named Mike May was in charge of decorating, and I knew Mike, and I called him up and told him what I had. I don't know if we can use those or not. He kind of sounded like that lady from Texas Commerce Bank. I don't know if we can use those or not, but I'll come by your warehouse and look at them. And the frames that are huge, and of course the paintings are huge, they're six feet by eight feet, just the paintings. And uh, I built the frames where you could take them apart so you can move them around. With the frame on it, it takes, would take big gorillas and a big vehicle to somehow to load them in. With the frames that would come apart, I can put Sam and George on one side and with some blankets, stack all the frame pieces on the other side and put them in the horse trailer. And that, they got moved around many times in that. Well, I called Mike and I said, I think these would look great in the sesquicentennial office because we have one of, of Sam Houston. And of course, Mike said, well, I don't know if we can use them. And when he came by my warehouse over in Spring Branch, I was out checking on some of the stores and I told the, my gal at the front desk that Mike May may come by and want to see these paintings, and I'm hoping he uses them, he can use them in the uh, sesquicentennial office in Tomball. It took most of us a long time to learn how to say or spell sesquicentennial. But uh, when I got back that day, I asked Lila, I said, uh, did Mike May come by? She laughed, said, did he come by? Said he was here five or ten minutes, saw the paintings, immediately got on the phone and called somebody he knew in Tomball with a U-Haul or a uh, rental thing and had a truck out here. He's already picked them up, uh, taken them back to Tomball, and he said, you need to be there at either 8 or 9 o'clock Monday or Saturday morning and bring all the tools you need to put them back together. And those two paintings hung in the Tomball sesquicentennial office that year. One day I was in there visiting with the little old lady, and I don't know if this name brings anything back to you or not. Does the name Miriam Hotard mean anything? Well, I'm sitting there talking to her, didn't know who she was. She was a little old frail thing, must have weighed, what, 85, 90 pounds. And I'm talking to her and I kept thinking there's something about her that's real familiar, didn't know what her name was. But I was in buying a few little souvenirs for Sesquicentennial and I said, uh, excuse me, I feel like I've known you from somewhere, what's your name? She said, I'm Miriam Hotard. And I said, oh my goodness. I said, I was the bookmobile driver and you were the librarian on that book, on that bookmobile. We, used, we went all over, all over Harris County taking books around. Anyway, uh, I've had a wonderful life. I uh, ended up selling my half of Goodson's to Jimmy and uh, I, had, I had to find a home for, jo for George and Sam, primarily Sam. I tried to give those, once I framed them up, I tried to give them to different state museums, nothing, nobody was interested. And I finally uh, uh, decided I need to build their own home. And I couldn't figure out what I wanted to name these, this building I want to build for a steakhouse for Sam and George to hang in. And I went up with some friends uh, from, from uh, Wood, Wildwood Baptist Church. Went up with some friends, Gene and Judy and Larry, Brother Larry, and my wife was working in the office up there, and they had a little, a little meeting of all the people that worked in the office up in uh, just the other side of Huntsville, going a little northeast, can't remember where we went. On the way back, Gene said, uh, let's stop in Huntsville rather than going back to Houston and try to stand in line to get something to eat. And uh, we had an early dinner. When we got through, there's a lot of daylight left. And Gene said, anybody want to see anything in Huntsville? And I said, Gene, when I got those, the painting of Sam about 35 years ago or so, I said, I had heard about a museum and a little park in Huntsville that also has Sam Houston's last home in that park. And I said, I said do you know where the steamboat house is? He said, I can drive you right to it, but we're going to go by the grave site first and see where Sam is buried. And uh, then we went to the Steamboat House. This is on a Saturday afternoon. I made little sketches of it. I took some pictures of it. And the following day, the sermon was not real uh, exciting. Everybody wondered what I was doing with my legal pad, and I was making the first floor plan to the Steamboat House restaurant. 
And so I decided that since that dawned on me while I was in church that the Lord must be blessing it. <laughs> and uh, my wife thought I was absolutely, totally crazy uh, selling my interest in Goodson's and uh, going and starting all over again at age 66, almost 11 years ago. And uh, it's been a great ride. Uh, I would, if we had kids in here, I would encourage every kid to do several things in life. I did not learn how to stand in front of a group and make a talk by myself. When I was in the JCs, which is an organization that our wonderful government ruined when they made all these men's organizations allow women in. I think the Rotary Club is great. It's not a problem. The Lions Club is great, but the, the JCs were an organization of young men between 21 and 35. When you, you couldn't join less than 21, when you got to be 35, they kicked you out. And a lot of gals that wanted to go find themselves a husband joined the JCs and a lot of marriages broke up when somebody was flirting with one of these young guys and uh, ended up leaving his wife and, and uh, marrying someone else and the JCs have crumbled to almost nothing. But they did have a, a program they called JC Speak Up. And when I got involved with the JCs, I was in, my, in the frame shop in, on Bel Air Boulevard and one of the fellows, the club, president of that club, knew I was very competitive. And one day he said, Charlie, we've had people in the, in the uh, scrapbook contest, and this contest, and that contest. We've never had anyone from our club join JC Speak Up. And he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. If you join, if you apply for it, you sign up for JC Speak Up at the next uh, area convention, big conventions, said, I'll, I'll do it too, and whoever comes out lower on the totem pole has to buy the other fellow and his wife a steak dinner. I said, Greg, you're on. Well, I had even closed my shop on Bel Air Boulevard early that day and run to Galveston, had somebody else draw my number, and if my number was too low, to sh swap it for one higher so I'd have time to get there, change clothes, and, and uh, go into this big, giant, empty ballroom and compete. And uh, when I got there, I found out that my number, I said to somebody that was going to draw my number, what's my number? Oh, you're number 13. That didn't do right for me right away. Then I saw Don coming down the hallway, the guy who's supposed to be competing with me, and he's uh, got about three days growth of beard. He's had a couple of to drink, and he's not doing real well. It's kind of staggering. And I said, Don, when are you supposed to speak? He said, oh, don't worry about it. I didn't sign up. I'm buying steak dinner tonight. Well. I was terrible. Uh, if you, the, they take the top five and they do a runoff, I didn't make the top five, but I felt like I was, you know, got my foot in the door. And uh, the club felt so bad about, and Don felt so bad about tricking me into that that he said, hey, the state convention's in Fort Worth. We'll pay your entry fee, the club pay your entry fee in the state convention. You're going to be there anyway up in Fort Worth if you'll, if you'll try it again. It's always on one of the tenets of the J.C. Creed. Faith in God gives meaning and purpose to human life, and I can't repeat them all. I, I could if I thought long enough. But uh, I decided to enter in Fort Worth, and in Fort Worth, you could st when you on the other competition, you couldn't go into the room until after you spoke or tell tell you spoke, and you couldn't go listen to the guys in front of you. Once you spoke, you could stay in the room. And at state convention, everybody was a number. When your number got called pulled out of the hat. That's when you went up. They didn't know what the, even what the order was going to be. And uh, I felt like when I got through at the state convention, I bet I beat half of them. And I was the only guy there that hadn't come in first, second, or third someplace around the state. And then Houston had a convention, and I said, I'm, I'm going to do it again. I, on my own, I'm going to sign up and go to the Houston convention. And at Houston, uh, when they got the top five, the top five then have to are assigned another topic and they've got uh, 45 minutes to go write a new speech, be ready to give a four to five minute speech. The first one was four to six minutes. You're a second over or a second short, you're in trouble. And uh, anyway, I came in second in Houston. I made the top five and I, after we got our second speech, I came in second. The next convention was in, in Port Arthur. And one of the guys there who had been at four or five of these uh, uh, com competitions that I've been in, he said, it shouldn't be fair to you do it again. You've already come in second. I said, yeah, but I'm going to keep going until I get first. 
And uh, the Lord took care of me, I, but I was busy all the first day running a, a little uh, seminar or symposium. Everyone was supposed to go to one of these seminars to learn about various projects that the JCs were doing. I couldn't go practice my speech all day that day like the other fellows were. And all I wanted to do was get by the first one and so I could get to the finals. And, uh, but I was busy running a, a clinic. And uh, I made the top five. And the, the five of us got in a little corner and the fellow in charge of it all said, uh, your new topic for your, your four to five minute talk and you need to be back here in 45 minutes ready to draw a number out of the hat and see what order you'll be in. Your new topic is make a four to five minute talk about the clinic you attended because everybody was supposed to go to a clinic. And I thought, God's looking out for me. And I went to my room, wrote a, wrote a little speech, did it to, a, to a, a, speak, a, a recorder I had, timed it with my little stopwatch I had, and it was about four and a half minutes. And I thought, sound pretty good to me. And I listened to it again. I said, I'm not going to change a word. I put that little speech on some note cards, tried it, practiced it a few times, listened to it a few times, and went down and was fortunate enough to, to walk away with the uh, JC Speak Up Award. But the first time I ever got in front of a group, I couldn't open my mouth. And today I make some place in the neighborhood of, of usually 50 to 60 or 70 talks about Texas history. And I'm going to quit in case anybody has a question about anything, including Texas history. And in Texas history, if I can't tell you what the answer is, I'll make up a good one. <laughs> Any questions? Was A.J. Floyd at Lamar when you were there? No, A.J.'s a little older than I am, but my first year in high school, I went to San Jacinto High School and it was supposed to be in the class that went to Bel Air. And uh, I, instead of going to Bel Air, Bel Air's new building wasn't going to be ready yet. You had a choice, you could go to Bel Air, you could go back to San Jacinto, or you could go to Lamar, and I, that's where my girlfriend was, so I went to Lamar. But at San Jacinto, in my homeroom, uh, AJ's sister, Marlene Foyt, was in my homeroom at San Jacinto. Yes, sir? Steamboat House, where does that name come from? The, the Steamboat House is a funny looking home that Dr. Rufus Bailey, who was a professor at Austin College and at one time was president of Austin College. Austin College that's in Sherman, Texas, very expensive school because uh, I think my ex-wife helped my daughter pick that out to help penalize me <laughs> because I paid for the college education. Uh, uh, Austin College started where Sam Houston State University is and Dr. Bailey wanted to see some new architecture in Huntsville and he had the, this funny looking home built that looks like a riverboat without a hull or a paddle and as a wedding gift to his son Frank when Frank and his new bride got married. And everyone was laughing about it because it looked like a riverboat without a hull or a paddle. They called it the Steamboat House. And Frank Bailey turned his dad down and said, thank you, Dad, no thank you, we don't want it. A few years later, when Dr. Bailey passed away, he left it to Frank in his will. And I don't think Frank, he couldn't get anybody that wanted to rent it, nobody wanted to buy it. And Sam Houston had been thrown out of the governor's office because he would not sign the papers to secede from the Union and join the Confederacy. And Sam and Margaret had lived in Houston most of their married life, and lived in Huntsville most of their married life. <clears throat> and he felt with the Civil War breaking out, they had a little home on Galveston Bay. But he thought if the Union Army invades through Galveston Bay, we're dead. So they wanted to go back to Huntsville, and I think Frank probably, probably let them live there free Sam lived in the Steamboat House a couple of years, and it was there in 1863 that he passed away, and it became a famous home. Three months later, Frank Bailey sold it for $4,000, which was a lot of money in 1863, because somebody that bought it wanted to buy the home that Sam had lived in, where he died, and where they had his funeral. But that's where the name comes from, and uh, when you walk in the restaurant, if you come through the where the entry is, uh, George Washington's hanging in the entry. He looks like a dollar bill turned around backwards, but he's six foot by eight. When you walk through that archway, the very first uh, picture on the right is a photograph showing you what the Steamboat House looks, out, looks like today and the whole write-up about Dr. Bailey. 
Anyone else? I wanted, I wanted to end and say we've lost some great people in the Tomball area in the last, let's say, 15 months. Uh, we, of course, uh, the one that, the first one that really shocked me was when, uh, when I found out that Wayne Glawyer had passed away. And Wayne was a great friend, uh, knew him through the Rotary Club, knew him by playing golf with him a lot of times, and he was just a real great friend. I didn't realize how ill he was. Last August, my family threw me two surprise birthday parties, and believe it or not, surprised me both times in the, in the same day. And the second one was at my daughter's home up in the woodlands, and Wayne, as I'm sure by then, wasn't feeling that good even back in, in August. And Wayne was there at my surprise birthday party, which really thrilled me. I didn't realize how, you know, how far along he was. And uh, the other day, my son used my, a bottle opener at the house. And I said, be careful with that. He said, what's, I said, that's an important bottle opener. He said, why is it? And I said, that's the one that Wayne Lawyer gave me on my surprise birthday party last year. And uh, he was a very special friend to a lot of people. I know of people who needed prescriptions done for, for emergencies, and he wasn't open on Sundays, but I know people that he would go down, if there was a need, he'd go down there and fill the prescriptions on Sunday for them when his, when his uh, pharmacy wasn't open. But he was a great friend there. Uh, then we lost, uh, at, at Wayne's, when I went to Wayne's General, I've got a friend that's a very dear friend. His name is Gene Campbell. He's the uh, gentleman in the white shirt over at this table. When I was made an honorary member of the Sons of the Republic of Texas, I met Gene and Joyce originally at Goodson's Cafe and really didn't know them that well. And they were good, good enough friends to follow me up to the Steamboat House. And when I said I was gonna be made an honorary member of the uh, Sons of the Republic of Texas, Instantly, these people said, we're going to be there. Where is it and when is it going to be? We're going to go there. We want to be there. Uh, I didn't realize what the big connection was, but Jean's wife, great lady, was Joyce Campbell. And she was a member of the Daughters of the Republic of Texas. She was a descendant of someone who lived here in Texas when it was a republic. And uh, they wanted to be there. And, and then, when I, especially when I told Jean where it was, because it was going to be at a at a place, that also a little resort that also had a golf course. And uh, we, we all, we got to play golf and go there. And they were there when I was sworn in as, a, as an honorary member of the Sons. Uh, my dear friend, Ron Stone, had been made an honorary member of the Sons. And he was a Knight of the Order of San Jacinto, which is the highest award anyone gives. And I haven't changed that little note that she had that said that the lady that introduced me said there were 36 living knights. And as of uh, earlier or late last week, there are only 35 living knights. One of them passed away. But Jean and Joyce were there. They've been real dear friends. And Joyce had a lot of health problems over the last few years. And uh, even though they weren't as out in the, in the public like Wayne was, uh, Gene and I have played probably, I figure, at least 300 rounds of golf together. We used to play every Tuesday and Thursday morning out at Houston Oaks, and out of about 300 rounds of golf, that man let me beat him one time. I think he just felt, felt guilty of, of whipping me so many times that that one day, I don't think he had a bad day, I think, I think he decided it was time to let Charlie win one. But they're real dear friends, and Joyce passed away a day one way or the other from when, when uh, Wayne Glawyer passed away. And that was the first time in my life I went to Joyce's funeral that morning, I went to Wayne's funeral that evening. After Wayne's, Wayne's funeral, I sat and talked for a few minutes with Diane Holland. Uh, Diane, Diane and I, number one, uh, we graduated from two different high schools in HISD the same year. And uh, her daughter and my one of her daughter and my daughter were cheerleaders at Tomball High School. So I got to know Diane very well. She also was the head of the chamber at one time before before the chamber found this guy, Bruce Hilligeist, they didn't have to go far for him. If you live in Tomball or live in the Tomball area or work in the Tomball area, uh, that's your favorite. If you live and work in Tomball, you're blessed. 
And Bruce, I guess, grew up in Tomball, the whole thing, and he is just Mr. Tomball. But I went to both Joyce's funeral and to Wayne's funeral that evening. Short time later, we lost Hap Harrington, who had been the superintendent of schools and uh, was also the mayor of Tomball. Uh, when we opened the restaurant up, I think Hap was still the mayor, and he and Shirley, and I believe it was some other lady came over, somebody kin to Shirley, and we were telling them about the chandelier in the ladies' restroom. And uh, when the ladies got through going to the restroom, they, they invited Hap to come back and see the chandelier. And because of the story, I told her how it, how it got there. And I told Hap as he was coming out of the restroom, I wish I had a camera. I wanted to get a picture of the Mayor Tomball coming out of the ladies' room. <laughs> anyway, we have a lot of problems in our country, and I want to end by saying, uh, Brother Don White, we lost him in April of last year, and he had some little yard signs that he put out all over that, that like the little yard signs. And it had a Bible verse on that yard sign, and I want to read it as, as the end of this little gathering. And the Bible verse is from 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And it says, if my people are called by my name, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. And I think our country's got a lot of problems today, and I think we all need to pray for it. Uh, it's amazing when you find out how many young people are involved in drugs and marijuana and cocaine and everything else under the sun. And I don't know how we're going to get out of it all unless we all do a lot of heavy praying and, and work with our kids and our family to make sure that they are straight and narrow. And I want to thank you for having me out today, and I appreciate, uh, appreciate you putting up with me.